Well, it's finally happened. We've only been waiting how long? Today it was announced that the uh, the North Sea Transition Authority, um, the regulator on behalf of the government, has given approval to Rosebank. Great, fantastic news. We're going to have a look um, at Rosebank, introduce what it is, uh, give a bit of background and tell the story. It uh, should be informative and um, help people understand what uh, what this means. So if we look here on this, uh, on this map, you can see that uh, Rosebank is located right up to the uh, to the north of Britain, just west of the Shetland Islands. It's this yellow dot that you can see illustrated here. So we can see on this map that Rosebank, it's located in uh, water depths of over 1,100 meters. That's over 3,000 feet water depth. So it's very deep water out in the Faroe Shetland Basin. The two companies involved in this, well, they are the Norwegian company Equinor with 80% equity and they're the operator and Ithaca Energy, who are actually part of the uh, Israeli parent company, uh, Delic, and uh, they have a 20% equity. So you can see here are all the uh, the press cuttings that have come. This is the, sort of the industry press, so uh, not the mainstream um, uh, tabloids and broadsheets that we get, but the industry press. And you can see they've covered this news, and there's quite a lot of excitement about this. And, of course, we see that there is uh, a reaction from the environmental lobbyists and uh, yes uh, they're talking about this should never have been allowed the worst thing that could ever possibly happen on the planet and there's a, an interview out in bbc which i find quite interesting it's a lawyer saying uh, oh we can't wait to take this and challenge it in court well yes i'm sure your fees will be fantastic but uh, you could declare an interest as well by the way uh, uh, we don't have any interest in it we are kind of uh, looking at oil and gas and uh, renewables projects worldwide but um, yeah we want to see uh, how does this land for the uk and uh, we're going to look at that and some more we'll come back to the protests so what you can see well the uk is an energy importer meaning uh, I think this is last year in 2020 to 2022, we imported 117 billion pounds worth of energy from overseas. Now, a lot of that was gas. It came from Norway. It came from the continent. But there was also LNG, liquefied natural gas, that was landed in the UK. And we've got other forms of, uh, of, of, of energy coming in from, from overseas. But all of that is money going out of the, uh, going out of the country. It's not helping the, uh, the balance of payments. Also, this bottom left graphic here, oil and gas meets 76% of the UK energy, and that was in uh, 2022. Now, that's driven by demand. Um, yes, that's the supply, but the demand is obviously the 100%. So where there is a shortfall, then it's going to be made up by importing energy from, from abroad. And we don't see signs that uh, consumption is going to change very much. We import a huge amount of oil and gas, and it's at great expense to the taxpayer. Imported energy means exporting jobs. Simple as that. Here's a graph that uh, actually originates from a Serica Energy presentation. It shows the, uh, the UK imports gap, and that gap is growing larger all the time. So, you know, if we don't produce it ourselves, we have to import it. And more to the point, it's got lower emissions than if we imported oil and gas from, from overseas. So you can see the import average here is around about 31 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per barrel. Now that's imported. If we look at this, you can see Rosebank, very, very much lower than that. And some combined West of Shetland development, if it was uh, electrified, and that could be some sort of combined Cambo, Rosebank, and possibly other facilities out west of Shetland, we could get even lower. That data was from Woodmac. Another combined uh, Woodmac and Voa Energy um, plot here, and it shows, um, well, what can happen? This is for a combined Rosebank and Cambo as a single pro project, and uh, it's actually showing that it could create, on average, around about 900 full-time jobs eat for per year for about the next 30 years if these two now 
today's announcement doesn't have any mention of Cambo. In fact, it doesn't even have any mention of Loch Nagar, which is a Jurassic um, accumulation that actually underlies uh, Rosebank. But we'll have a look at that in, uh, in a short while. So this is uh, where we get our data from. Now, if you don't know about Trove databases, you've been missing out. Uh, Trove is uh, basically, it's got information on just about every field and every discovery worldwide. And this is just the, uh, the material we have in it for, for Rosebank. All sorts of information, seismic lines, geological cross-sections, um, write-ups on uh, where we've got to on the project. Um, all sorts. You can see the little thumbnails there, but uh, get in touch if you want some more information. Now, how does Rosebank compare to the rest of Northwest Europe? Well, as you can see, we've got a series of graphs here. And on this top left, you can see in terms of permeability, the reservoir at Rosebank is amongst the best that we get, certainly at this depth. It's a, a Darcy permeability plus. In terms of porosity, well, again, it's looking pretty good for its depth. It's certainly uh, upper quartile. The uh, porosity permeability, you can see this uh, graph top right, that it's basically, um, basically looking very, very good. One of the better reservoirs that we come across. In terms of the API gravity of the oil, and we'll come back on the oil properties, but you can see kind of middle of the range here for its uh, for the depth. In terms of pressure, well, you can see the pressure here. It's a hydrostatic pressure gradient. It's not overpressured in this zone here. And in terms of temperature, well, it's around about normal for the uh, for the depth. Now, if we have a look at the uh, the reservoir that. Uh, for the, uh, for the field, and here's the stratigraphy here. This actually comes from a, an old Chevron document, but uh, Chevron used to be in this, uh, in this acreage. Uh, in fact, bizarrely, um, it started life that Chevron were in west of Shetland, and then they decided it wasn't going anywhere quickly enough, so they, uh, they actually got out of west of Shetland. But then they went ahead and merged with Texaco. And guess what? Texaco had quite a significant... Uh, acreage position west of Shetland. So Chevron ended ended up getting back in to west of Shetlands and into Rosebank. But then later on, uh, it was uh, acquired or um, sold on to, um, to Equinor and to uh, Ithaca Energy. But uh, in terms of stratigraphy, well, we're looking here at the uh, lower Eocene, so tertiary age sands. And it, the reservoir is the Colse sandstone member here within the uh, essentially it's the 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 40 sandstone equivalent for those who are, are more familiar with north sea geology but um, this is west of shetlands and these are the sands now um, it's quite a young reservoir but we do also have a much deeper down we have some oil reservoir in the jurassic sands Here's a structure map. This is a time structure. It shows the uh, it shows the, the the field. It's an elongate uh, four way dip closed feature, uh, high up to here to the north called Rosebank North, and then Rosebank Main. There are six wells that have appraised the field, so it's pretty well understood. And uh, we can see that this is a scale bar down here. It's uh, five kilometers. Uh, so you can see that the field is somewhere in the region what fifteen to twenty kilometers long. So next, we'll have a look at a, a cross-section and just have a look at the, at the reservoir in a little bit more detail. Here's a geoseismic cross-section. And uh, we can see the structure here. We can see the overlying, the, um, the Stronce group, drill on through that, through the boulder, into the Hildesay. But it's actually within these volcanic um, deposits, these basalts, extrusive basalts, that we find these, uh, these sandstones. So this is what's known as a volcanic plastic reservoir. And you get these sandstones developed at times when the volcanics are not erupting in the region. These sands are swept into the basin. And you can see there are three or four sands, typically four, and they're filled with oil and in some cases with, uh, with gas as well. This is what they look like on electric logs. This is a gamma ray here. And then we're looking at the resistivity log on the right. The, uh, the structure, there's a sort of a Mesozoic high here, and it's a, a compression-induced um, inversion structure. So we, we get this high uh, being formed here through compression. 
So this is what it looks like in a different section. So you can see there is actually gas in some of these sands sitting above the oil. And then we go down and into the Jurassic here. This is the find that's called Loch Nagar. Now, there's no mention of the, that it, this is going to be developed. Uh, it will be a lot uh, deeper, a lot higher pressure, and a lot um, a lot hotter as well. But the concentration is going to be on the Colze 1, 3, and 4 sands. So um, that's the, the initial development. Now, as well as that, uh, if we look at the oil properties here, you can see it's uh, sort of a mid-30s API gravity crude oil. Um, it's not very viscous at all. It's got a significant proportion of wax, but then uh, you'll see that that's been allowed for in the uh, chosen development options. There's low amounts of asphaltine. And the pore point, 20 to 38 degrees centigrade. So it's a really a pretty good quality crude oil. It's not got any of the... Uh, the sort of the high sulfur crudes that you might find in other parts of the world that we have to uh, import and then process and and actually deal with um, things like sulfur and hydrogen sulfide. It's a very good quality crude. Here is a proposed uh, field layout. Now, this may not be the latest and greatest, but what they're proposing here as Equinor as operator is they're going to do uh, seven wells in phase one and five wells in, in phase two. So um, if it's going to go ahead as a phase development, you can see this would be the location here of the FPSO. And uh, you can see the, the, the layout of the field. There's basically drill centers at B, C, and D, and uh, there's basically a number of producing wells here. That's a total of seven producing wells. But there's also some spare slots. In total, five spare slots on those three uh, drill centers and manifolds with oil flowing back to the FPSO. And indeed, there is also some water injection wells. So they're marked on the map here as uh, um, I, J, K, L, and M. And... We then have a, uh, in red at the bottom, we have this gas export line, which is actually teeing into the line that goes out. Uh, it's the Western Shetland pipeline system. So this is the proposal to actually export the gas. So there will be no flaring associated with this and uh, all the gas will be exported and used uh, on the Shetland Islands. So this is great news for the UK. More jobs, lower lower emissions. Um we're not going to be exporting our emissions to other countries. We're going to deal with it, um, uh, you know, in a, in a responsible manner. Um, we've got good regulations in place. Now, if you want to stop oil, you're going to have to actually go after the demand, not the supply. If all you're going to try and do is cut the supply, then you're going to have to explain to people why their energy costs are going so much higher, are going to be so much higher. And, you know, the fact that it's damaging the UK economy and we're also going to end up with higher global emissions. So if you want to stop oil, please, you know, choose your battles. It's not here at Rosebank. It's elsewhere. So if you want data on oil and gas fields, then you need Trove. Trove has got all the data on every field worldwide. Now, having recorded the video, and please understand, uh, the announcement was only made this morning. We've had to research the subject. Fortunately, we've had all the data at our fingertips because we've got it already in our Trove databases, but we still have to pull together a presentation, our script. We have to record it. We have to edit it. And we have to top and tail it and put it out there on YouTube, which is what you're watching right now. We did miss a few things, and I don't want to be accused of telling just part of the story, so a couple of other... Uh, a couple of other thoughts. Has the delay helped? So Rosebank's been talked about for a long, long time and this development, it's taken a while to actually get approval. Now, uh, part of that is uh, just justifying it. Uh, the, the investment is huge. Um, but what, uh, what has it meant for the, the UK economy? Well, uh, one of the things that's happened is that uh, if we developed this some years ago, we could have got rig rates around about $170,000 a day. Now we're paying $430,000 a day. So that's gone up quite a lot. Wells are going to cost hmm, around about $100 million each. Now, that's uh, if it goes ahead with the, the 12 wells that are uh, described in the combined phase one and phase two. 
that's going to be $1.2 billion. Now, that money is going out uh, to uh, the, the the rig owners, the uh, the well management companies, all the service companies, and all the personnel on board. So it's not going to be going to the Treasury. Uh, it's going to be basically expensed by uh, the, the companies developing the field, uh, rightly so. And uh, that's part of the investment. But had we done it some years ago? There would have been more money in it for the Treasury. But alas, these delays make little sense. We could also have had a lot of production on stream by now, which um, would have helped. Um, as it is, we're going to have to wait a couple of years until uh, we get to first oil. The, the second point uh, I'd like to add is the uh, the protesters. Well, you know, if they do have a rational case, if they do have the numbers, come on out, present it to the public. You know, the uh, the companies, the operators here, they've basically laid bare the, uh, the, the project description, all of the uh, justifications, the emissions, everything is in the environmental statement. It's all out in the public domain. If, uh, if you've got something more than, oh, it's killing the planet, well, you know, show us the numbers, show us the justification. It's simply not enough. It really is not enough just to say, this is awful, stop it now. Show us the data. Rosebank is going to create jobs. It's going to get money into the UK Treasury. It's uh, it's essentially going to uh, help improve the UK economy at a time when we're still recovering from the pandemic. We're still in the uh, after effects of Brexit. Things are not going as well as they could. Something like Rosebank certainly is going to help. Lower greenhouse emissions. At the minute, we're importing oil from overseas. That's very high emissions. Lower them by developing Rosebank. And for the protesters, think about this. The problem's consumption. People are using oil and gas and other forms of energy, which we're going to go on to in a minute. But uh, targeting production, does it help? Well, it puts up the costs and it's the consumer who's going to pay at the end of the day. Doesn't make an awful lot of sense to me. Final point. Look at this graph here. This is a graph from Gridwatch. Uh, now, there's the uh, there's the link you can find at gridwatch.co.uk. It shows you what the UK is using for uh, for, for power right now. Now, um, there is a there's a key down here on the uh, the bottom right, and uh, you know, pause the video and have a look at that if you want to understand. But in a nutshell, you can see that wind is in blue, and um, when the wind's blowing, we get quite a lot of our energy. When the wind's not blowing, we get very little. How's it how's it made up? Well, it's nuclear and gas that make up most of it. Now, you can see other things on here. You can see pumped hydro, hydro. You can see biomass. You can see all sorts of uh, other renewables and other energy sources. But you can see that it is great um, when the wind's blowing, we get lots of energy. But when it's not, we need to substitute that. Or people can turn off the heating turn off their, uh, their cookers and uh, we can go back to living in caves if you wish. At the end of the day, if people want to go on living the lifestyle that they've, uh, that they've attained, we are going to be dependent for many, many years to come on particular gas and other forms of fossil fuel. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you back on our channel before too long. Well done to Equinor and Ithaca for eventually getting Rosebank across the line. Bye for now. There are a number of wells uh, indicated on the map here. There's uh, four, five wells that have been drilled on the structure. Um, one, two, three, four, five. <clears throat> there are six wells that have been drilled on the structure.